<clears throat> Welcome. Today we shall discuss black holes, black holes of general relativity. Let us pick up the story from where we left off in the previous lecture. In 1938, Oppenheimer and his student Volkov showed that there is a maximum mass for neutron stars. They estimated that the maximum mass of the neutron star is of the order of 0.7 solar mass, but then there was some considerable uncertainty about it because they had not taken into account nuclear repulsion at very high densities. In 1938, nuclear physics was still a fairly young subject. But they went on to ask, even though there may be an uncertainty about the precise value of the maximum mass of neutron stars, what will be the fate of really massive stars? And for this study, he picked a student by name Hartland Snyder. He was a very, very special student. As I said last time, he was a truck driver who suddenly decided that he wanted to do theoretical physics. He was not only extremely talented in mathematics, but he was also extremely careful in dealing with mathematical subtleties. And that is precisely the kind of student Oppenheimer wanted for this rather tricky study. What they did was to study the implosion of a star in general relativity. This is a hard problem. And Oppenheimer told Snyder to do this exactly without making any mathematical approximations in the calculations. But he did allow him to make some simplifying assumptions about the nature of the collapsing star. They assumed that the star was spherical and non-rotating. They assumed that there was no internal pressure or energy generation, etc., etc. But given these reasonable simplifying assumptions, Snyder went on to do an exact calculation within the premise of general relativity. And this is what he found. Statement number one. As the star nears the critical radius, we shall see what the critical radius is in a moment, its shrinkage slows down till it becomes frozen precisely at the critical radius. This is what an observer at infinity will see of the collapsing star. Whereas, an observer riding on the surface of the star, co-moving with the star, will find that the implosion does not freeze at all. So you have two diametrically opposite descriptions of the same event, namely the collapse of a star. <clears throat> the final sentences of the paper were the following, and I quote, When all thermonuclear sources of energy are exhausted, a sufficiently massive star will collapse. The radius of the star approaches asymptotically its gravitational radius. Light from the surface of the star is progressively reddened and can escape over a progressively narrower and narrower range of angles. The star thus tends to close itself off from any communication with a distant observer. Only its gravitational field persists. So they concluded that really massive stars will not find peace as white dwarfs or as neutron stars, but will become black holes. As I said, the day this paper appeared in Physical Review, in September 1939, World War II was declared, and nobody paid attention to physics for the next six years or so. But long before that, in 1935, at a meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society in London, in response to Chandrasekhar's paper, this is what Eddington presiding of the, over that meeting said. A star has to go on radiating and radiating, and contracting and contracting until, I suppose, it gets down to a few kilometers radius when gravity becomes strong enough to hold in the radiation. 
and the star can at last find peace. Various accidents may intervene to save the star, but I want more protection than that. I think there should be a law of nature to prevent a star from behaving in this absurd way. So that was Sir Arthur Eddington four years before Oppenheimer and Schneider's paper. The same year as Oppenheimer and Schneider's paper, Albert Einstein wrote a rather important paper where he argued that black holes predicted by gen his own theory of general relativity cannot possibly exist in nature. Here is a sentence from this paper, and I quote, an essential result of this investigation is a clear understanding as to why the Schwarzschild singularities do not exist in physical reality. The fact of the matter is, although mathematically this paper by Einstein was quite rigorous, his physics was not quite correct. He did not allow for the possibility of an implosion of the star. Now let's go back in time to the year 1783, Cambridgeshire in England. There, a pastor in a church by name John Mitchell wrote an extraordinary paper. In this paper, John Mitchell argued that if a star were to be as small as 2 gm by c squared in its radius, Excuse me. If a star were to be as small as 2 gm by c squared in its radius, no light will escape from the star and the star will be a black star. He argued as follows. Let us consider a star of mass m and radius r. The escape velocity from the star is to be calculated in Newton's mechanics according to the relation that half mv squared, which is the kinetic energy of the escaping particle, must be equal to the potential energy g m m over r, and that gives the expression for the escape velocity a square root of 2 g m over r. Therefore, when the radius of the star becomes equal to 2 g m by c squared, the escape velocity from the star will become equal to the velocity of light itself, and the star will appear black. Five years later, in his very famous book, the great mathematician Laplace wrote as follows, a luminous star of the same density as the Earth and whose diameter should be 250 times larger than that of the Sun would not, in consequence of its attraction, allow any of its rays to arrive at us. It is therefore possible that the largest luminous bodies in the universe may, through this cause, be invisible. Ten years later, Laplace published the second edition of this extremely popular book, and there this paragraph was missing. He no longer made this statement. Why? Because in the intervening ten years, Huygens in Holland and Young in England had discovered the phenomena of interference of light. And it became clear that life couldn't possibly be corpuscles, but light must be a wave. And there was no way to treat waves within Newtonian gravity. And one had to wait for a long time till 1915 when on the 25th of November, Einstein published his famous general theory of relativity, the new theory of gravity. And the essence of this theory was that gravity is just geometry. Gravity is not a force. Now, there are two qualitatively new features in this theory, theory of general relativity. One, it predicts the existence of gravitational waves. We shall discuss this a few lectures from now. Second, it predicts the occurrence of black holes. That black holes are natural consequences of the new theory of gravity 
became clear within a month after Einstein published his paper. The man who made this remarkable discovery was a German by name Karl Schwarzschild, a very distinguished mathematician, a most distinguished theoretical physicist, an instrument builder, and an observational astronomer. Now, he made this discovery under rather extraordinary circumstance. In 1915, Germany was at war with Russia. The World War I was raging. And Karl Schwarzschild was a senior officer in the German army fighting in the Russian front. Sitting in the trenches, he had read Einstein's paper on his new theory of gravity. And immediately, he was able to find a solution to Einstein's complicated set of differential equations. Not only he found a solution, he found an exact solution to Einstein's equation. So he sent a postcard from the war front to Einstein describing the new solution. Einstein almost fell out of his chair because he really believed that it was extremely unlikely that anybody would ever be able to find an exact solution to his complicated set of equations, and yet Schwarzschild had found the solution. So Einstein went before the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin and read this new discovery of Schwarzschild on behalf of Schwarzschild. Now what Schwarzschild's paper dealt with was the following. It, it described the curvature of space and time near a spherically symmetric massive body outside the spherically symmetric massive body. And this was the exact solution of Einstein's equation that Schwarzschild found under these very remarkable uh, circumstances. If you remember, according to Minkowski, ds squared, which is the distance between two events in space-time, which are infinitesimal distance apart, is given by c squared dt squared minus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared in bracket, or written in terms of polar coordinate, it would have read c squared dt squared minus dr squared minus r squared into sine squared theta d phi squared plus d theta squared. I'm sure you are familiar with writing this in spherical polar coordinate. But there were two important differences. One was the appearance of this factor 1 minus 2 gm by rc squared as the coefficient of c squared and d squared, c squared dt squared, and 1 over 1 minus 2 gm by rc squared as the coefficient of dr squared. This coefficient of c squared dt squared represents the warpage of time. This represents the fact that clocks tick slower in a gravitational potential. And this second coefficient of dr squared represents the warpage of space or the curvature of space. That's it. This is an exact solution of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And one can use this solution now to find the behavior of particles and light around a spherically symmetric massive body which is what Schwarzschild did in his paper. So this paper describes not only the curvature of space, but also the warpage of time near the star. Warpage of time is just time dilatation due to gravity. Clocks tick slower in the presence of a gravitational field. Now this leads to the gravitational redshift of light emitted from the surface. Near the star, time flows more slowly than far away. Therefore, the frequency of light will be lowered as light escapes the gravitational potential of the star. Radiation from the star will be shifted to longer wavelengths. It will be red shifted. Let us see how to understand this in very simple terms. There is the surface of a massive body, the sun or the earth, 
and I emit a photon of a certain frequency nu with energy E is equal to h nu. The statement is that as this photon climbs the gravitational potential well, its wavelength will get stretched, frequency will get diminished, and this is redshift. Why will this happen? We can anticipate this already in special relativity. As light climbs against gravity, its potential energy will decrease, just as the potential energy of a thrown stone up will decrease. In the case of a stone, the increase in the potential energy comes at the expense of the kinetic energy of the stone and the stone will slow down. But light cannot slow down. Light must always travel at the speed c. Therefore, what it can do is its frequency can decrease because you want the energy to decrease. If the frequency decreases according to Einstein's relation E is equal to h nu, then the frequency will decrease. Therefore, the wave will be stretched to longer wavelengths. This extremely simple consideration will tell you that if nu1 is the frequency of light emitted from the surface of a star of mass m and radius r, then nu2, the frequency detected by an observer outside, will be nu2 is equal to nu1 into 1 minus gm by rc squared. It's a very simple derivation. It shouldn't take you more than 60 seconds to do this, and I urge you to do this. Now, Schwarzschild didn't do that. He produced an exact result by solving Einstein's equations of general relativity. And what he found was precisely the same sort of result, except there was a two in the numerator inside the parenthesis. So our very poor man's derivation was right except for a factor of 2 over there. Very good. So now let's proceed. So that is Schwarzschild's exact result for the gravitational redshift of a photon emitted from the surface of a massive body. At r is equal to 2 gm by c squared, the redshift becomes infinite. When r is equal to 2 gm by c squared, nu2 becomes equal to zero. What it means is that the wave is stretched to an infinite wavelength. The redshift becomes infinite and the frequency becomes zero and no energy escapes from the star. So this is the critical radius. r is equal to 2 gm by c squared. This is the critical radius that Oppenheimer and Schneider were referring to. So as the star approaches the critical radius, 2 gm by c squared. As far as the observer at infinity is concerned, the collapse slows down, slows down, slows down, and it freezes, and it never crosses this critical radius. Okay. At, at the critical radius, time dilatation becomes infinite. So redshift becomes infinite, or reciprocal of that, time dilatation becomes infinite. Time does not flow at all. Therefore, a clock on the surface of a star of radius 2 gm by c squared will stop ticking as far as the observer at infinity is concerned. But the star doesn't stop ticking. It's just that the ticks never reach you. As seen by the outside observer, the frequency of light emitted goes to zero and the wavelength of the radiation becomes infinite and the star appears black. So, what did John Mitchell say in 1783? That when the radius of the star is equal to 2 gm by c squared, the star will become black. What does Einstein say or Schwarzschild say? That when r is equal to 2 gm by c squared, the star will appear black. So is all Einstein saying is what John Mitchell said way back in 1783? No, not at all. There is a profound difference between the black star of John Mitchell and the black star of Einstein and Schwarzschild. And the difference is the following. Here is the black star of uh, John Mitchell, whose radius is 2 gm by c squared. Light is emitted. Light is corpuscle at that time, corpuscular theory of light. But the photon 
as we now call it, will go up and come down. So it will not reach infinity. So the observer at infinity will see the star as black. But suppose I manage to orbit the star at a close radius, the dashed circle over there, then I can detect the photon. So the point is that an observer, an astronomer close enough to the star will be able to shine a torchlight, put a mirror on the star and see the reflected light. But you can't do that in general relativity. Here, when the star collapses to the critical radius, this is the time axis. There's no time shown here. This is the time axis. In Einstein's theory, no matter how close you are to the critical surface, no light can be seen to be emerging because the frequency will go to zero and the wavelength will go to infinity and no energy can come out. So even an astronomer orbiting very close to the black star will not be able to see it no matter what trick he or she may employ. And this is the essential difference. So when you think of a black star or a black hole, as we now call it, in general relativity, you shouldn't think in terms of the escape velocity becoming greater than the speed of light. You must think in terms of the redshift becoming infinite. And you must think in terms of time dilatation becoming infinite. Now let us do an experiment. A flash of light, I emit a flash of light, with my torchlight here, over there. A flash of light will expand in all directions in space. The wavefront will be the surface of a sphere expanding in three dimensions at the speed of light. Its projection in two dimensions will be a set of concentric circles. This is the expanding wavefront projected onto two dimensions as a function of time. The important thing to notice is that at all times, the point of emission will always be at the center of the expanding spherical wavefront. The point of emission will always be at the center of the expanding spherical wavefront. This will not be the case in the vicinity of a black hole. Now these are diagrams that I am borrowing from Roger Penrose. As usual, he came up with geometrical diagrams, which tells the story much better than any mathematical equation is likely to tell you or me. So here is a black hole. At large distances, the point of emission will lie at the center of the expanding spherical wavefront. But the story will be very different as I emit a flash of light closer and closer to the black hole. Because what we will find, at short distances from the event horizon, as we shall call it, the surface of the black hole very soon, the wavefront surface is displaced by the strong gravity. So you notice that the point of emission, which is the black dot, is no longer at the center of the spherically expanding wavefront. The wavefront is still expanding at the speed of light. Because locally, special relativity is still valid. Light will still expand at the speed of light as spherical wavefront. But the point of emission is now displaced because the wavefront is pulled towards the black hole by strong gravity. At precisely the surface of the black hole, or precisely at the event horizon, the spherical wavefront surface touches the horizon internally, and there is the point of emission. In other words, at the surface of the black hole, if I emitted a flash of light, no wavefront, no portion of the wavefront will be outside the black hole. The entire spherical wavefront will be inside the black hole as shown in this diagram. Now, if I go further inside the event horizon, the expanding wavefront detaches itself from the point of emission. Here is the point of emission, here is the expanding wavefront. It has completely detached itself. This surface is known as the trapped surface named by Roger Penrose. 
The significance of this trap surface is the following. Light, once you are inside the trap surface, light emitted in any direction is pulled towards the central singularity. So if I am on this blue surface, the trap surface, even if I emit light with my torchlight pointing outwards, the light will only go in towards the central singularity. That is the essence of the black hole. Since no observer, you or me, or any particle can travel faster than light, it follows that there can be no stationary observers within the horizon. Every material particle will be pulled inexorably towards the central singularity. So the point I'm making is simply the following. Even light couldn't save itself. Therefore, you and me cannot save ourselves. There are no trajectories of constant radii once you enter the black hole. You have no choice but to go to smaller and smaller radii and eventually crash into this singularity. So the black hole of general relativity is an imaginary surface. There is no object whose radius is 2 gm by c squared. It is an imaginary surface through which the star collapsed and it can never come out again because no light or material particle can come out because I've just made the argument for that in a rigorous fashion. Now the surface of the black hole is known as the event horizon. It is a semi-permeable surface. Things can only go into the horizon. Nothing can come out. Not even light can come out. Inside the event horizon, there are no allowed trajectories with constant distance from the center. You cannot say, oops, I'm terribly sorry I came into the black hole. Now I'm going to fire some rocket and stay at a constant radius from the center. You cannot do that. You can only do that if you can travel faster than light. And since you cannot do that, there are no allowed trajectory with a constant distance from the center. The infalling matter cannot arrest its collapse. The only allowed trajectories, the only allowed trajectories for matter and light are those along which all matter and light will fall to the center of the black hole. So the event horizon is a very special surface. Once you cross it, you have gone past a point of no return. And here is another beautiful diagram due to Roger Penrose. Here, the two space dimensions, and this is the time dimension. What he's trying to show is once the star collapses to the radius 2 gm by c squared, the light cones, which are the geometrical structures in space-time corresponding to expanding spherical wave fronts that I referred to when, I, when we discussed Minkowski space-time, the light cones get tipped because of strong gravity. This is another way of saying that the wave front is pulled towards the gravity. And then once in, you enter the event horizon, the wave front detaches and everything falls towards the central singularity. And this is the evolution of the singularity as a function of time, time evolving vertically. Now, let us do the following experiment. A faraway observer drops the stone towards the black hole. What will he see as the velocity of the stone, dr by dt? It's a very simple calculation to do because you now have Schwarzschild's metric. So you can use the equations of Einstein and Schwarzschild's metric and calculate dr by dt. It's a fairly straightforward and almost elementary calculation. And if you do that, this is what you'll get. You'll get two factors with a minus sign. First factor is 1 minus 2 gm by rc squared. The second factor is square root of 2 gm by rc squared. If you remember, that is the velocity in Keplerian 
or Newtonian mechanics of a body falling towards a massive body. Now, what is this trying to tell you? It's trying to tell you something which I'll show pictorially. But before that, let us imagine that around a black hole, I build with modern nanomaterials, which are infinitely rigid, a shell where an astronomer can sit. Because everything else will be torn apart near a black hole due to tidal forces. So let's imagine that I'm a smart enough engineer that I can invent a material which is strong enough to withhold the tidal forces and I create a little platform where there is a little space station where there is an astronomer. He is observing this falling stone with his clock. What will he say is the velocity of this particle? The, the velocity as seen by an observer on a stationary infinitely rigid shell, the blue shell, will say, no, 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 no. The velocity of the particle is minus square root of 2 gm by rc squared. This first factor is missing. So this is what Hartland Schneider found in his calculation. Diametrically opposite description of the same phenomena, a falling stone by a distant observer and by an observer who is falling with the stone or who manages to stay stationary over there. So let's, Chinese saying, one picture is worth 10,000 words, let's plot this. What is plotted on the y-axis, this is zero, this is half the speed of light, this is the speed of light, this is the velocity of the falling stone. And what is plotted on the x-axis is distance from the center of the black hole. Rg is the gravitational radius or the Schwarzschild radius, 2 gm by c squared. This is four times Rg, just for some reference. So what you find if I plot this expression is initially, the observer at infinity will say that the stone is falling faster and faster and faster. The speed is increasing. That's what you'll find. If you go to the top of Empire State Building and drop the stone, you'll find the stone is falling faster and faster and faster and faster. It is accelerating towards the center of the Earth. But if you come closer and closer to the gravitational radius or the short shield radius, you notice that the velocity decreases till finally when the stone reaches the short shield radius, its velocity goes to zero. This is what Hartland Schneider said, is that as the star approaches the critical radius, Rg, it will freeze, it will no longer contract. In other words, the velocity with which it's contracting goes to zero. But now let us plot this velocity as seen by a co-moving observer or an astronomer on a rigid shell near the black hole. What you will find is this. You will find the stone is coming from infinity faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And when it reaches the short shell radius, its speed will become infinite. And of course, you cannot see what happens to the stone beyond that point. So this is the diametrically opposite description of the same event that Hartland, Schneider and Oppenheimer found way back in 1939. It's a very simple consequence of infinite time dilatation. But physicists and astronomers, including Einstein, was not were not willing to accept this concept of infinite redshift or infinite time dilatation. That is why the notion of black hole itself was rejected for a very long time. Now let us say the stone has entered the black hole at a radius rg, 2 gm by c squared. How long will it take for that stone to hit the central singularity? We have already said that this stone has no alternative but to fall in. There are no trajectories of constant radii the moment I enter the event horizon. And that what general relativity gives you for this time, delta tau is the very simple expression, 2 by 3 into the Schwarzschild radius divided by c, 2 gm by c cubed. 
RGS 2GM by C square. You have to put one more C in the denominator. This is the time as measured by the clock of the moving observer, collapsing observer. So I want you to do two simple problems. It will be fun for you. Let us say that this black hole has a mass equal to the mass of the sun. Use the formula Rg is equal to 2gm by c square. Put m is equal to mass of the sun and calculate what the radius ought to be of the black hole. Then use the formula that I showed you in the previous slide, this formula, and calculate how long it will take for you or the stone to crash to the central singularity. Now imagine that you are entering the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. We shall talk about this in a later lecture. The mass of the galaxy, as deduced from observation, is 3 million solar masses. Again, calculate the radius of the black hole and calculate the time for which you live the moment you enter the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And the two numbers will be great fun to look at. Please do this. It shouldn't take you more than two minutes to do this. Now, I want to introduce something called the effective potential. Let's first discuss the effective potential in Newtonian theory. What this effective potential is simply the following. Let's look at the diagram on the left. Plotted on the y-axis is the potential energy against the distance. This curve to which I'm, plot I'm using the cursor is the angular momentum, is the repulsive potential due to the angular momentum. And this dash curve to which I'm pointing now is simply the 1 over r gravitational potential well. So remember in Newtonian mechanics, if you're going around the body, there are two forces. One is the centrifugal force, the other is the gravitational force. And there is a potential corresponding to these forces. And this is the gravitational potential energy. This is the centrifugal barrier because you're going round. And the, the solid curve is the sum of the two. So there is a nice potential which I have shown over there. That solid curve is the effective potential in Newtonian theory. Look at any elementary book on mechanics and you will see the details of this effective potential. But I hope the concept is clear to you. It is really very simple. The, what I plotted as and called as the effective potential is simply the sum of the gravitational attractive potential and the repulsive centrifugal potential. So suppose I put a particle at the minimum of this potential. This is the radial distance r from the center of the star. So I can go around the star keeping that distance the same because this is only a plot in one section of actually a three-dimensional plot. Remember, one over r potential is a three-dimensional potential. So it's not just a one-dimensional potential. So I can rotate this in uh, three dimensions. And that will give me a circular orbit. So a particle, if it happens to be at the minimum of the effective potential, will go around the sun in circular orbits. But the planets are not at the minimum of the effective potential. The planets are at some distance from the minimum of the effective potential. So it will fall to the minimum of the effective potential and it will oscillate like a simple pendulum, like a molecule, vibration of a molecule. Or if I have a pendulum, and I let it swing, it will go past the equilibrium position to the other side and it will oscillate. Precisely the same thing. Now, that motion, in addition to the circular motion, so all I'm saying is, so let me say it the other way around. The planets are going around the sun in circular orbits, but they're also moving in this way. So this motion combined with the circular motion is an elliptical orbit. It's a closed ellipse. This is why Keplerian orbits are ellipses. This is why Kepler said, found 
that planets move in an elliptical orbit with the sun as one of its foci. So the orbits of the planets are ellipses for this very simple reason. Now, this is no longer the story in the case of general relativity. Because now you can ask, what is the effective potential of a particle going around a star of mass m in general relativity? It's a very simple question for which there is a very simple answer. And the answer is this curve to which I am now pointing. It also has a minimum, but it also has a maximum. In Newtonian potential, the repulsive barrier goes to infinity as the angular momentum increases. But in general relativity, the effective potential has a maximum. So there are two very important differences between the effective potential in Einstein's theory and effective potential in Newtonian theory. Effective potential in the Newtonian theory leads to elliptical orbits. Here you'll find it does not lead to elliptical orbits. And the reason is simply the following. One is that this potential curve is not what is shown in Newtonian theory. There is an important difference in the curvature over there. And the second thing is that there is a maximum over there. So this leads to very different orbits around a black hole in general relativity. So what I've shown on the left is once again the effective potential in Newtonian theory and the effective potential in Einstein's theory of gravity, which is what I've shown in the panel on the right. So concentrate on this brown curve, the solid brown curve. Y-axis is the effective potential, x-axis is the distance from the star. There are four regimes that I want to distinguish. One is, let a test particle be at the minimum of the effective potential in Einstein's theory. So that particle will go around just as in Newtonian theory, and the orbit will be a stable circular orbit. Fine. Now let us imagine that the test particle is over there. It will go and oscillate. And because this potential here is not symmetrical about the minimum, the amplitude of the oscillation will be more on this side and less on this side, as you may see from that, from that line Mark 2 over there. So the particle is going around in a circle, circle around the central body. It's also doing this radial motion, but the amplitude of the radial motion is not symmetrical about the points on the circle. This has a very important consequence. The consequence is that in the case 2, if the energy of the particle corresponds to 2, then you find the, op the orbits are elliptical, but the ellipses are not closed ellipses. In Keplerian theory, in Newtonian theory, this frequency of this oscillation, the frequency of the radial oscillation, is the same as the frequency of the circular motion. And that leads to a circle being deformed to a closed ellipse. So let me say it again. The frequency of this radial oscillation is the same as the frequency of circular motion. And that leads to closed ellipses. But in the case of an asymmetrical potential, the frequency of the radial oscillation is not the same as the frequency of the circular motion. And because of this, the ellipses will precess. So a fundamental difference between the orbits of planets in Newtonian theory and Einstein's theory is, whereas the orbits of an individual planet, suppose there is only one planet, 
its orbit will be an ellipse, a closed ellipse, as Kepler said. The, the fact of the matter is that you don't have a single planet. You have nine planets. And therefore, as planet one is going around the sun, it is perturbed by the other eight planets. So it turns out that even in Newtonian theory, the orbits of planets are not closed ellipses. The ellipses precess madly. But here I'm not bringing in other eight planets. I'm saying even if there is only one single test particle going around the central star, its orbit will not be closed ellipses. The orbits will precess. We shall come to this prediction in one or two lectures when we discuss the tests of general relativity using pulsars. Now let us go to particle with energy 3. Now that particle, which is sitting on top of that maximum of the potential, will move around in circle. But that circular orbit is not stable. With the slightest perturbation, that particle will fall into the black hole. And that's what I have indicated over there. So this is a knife edge orbit. In other words, points at C, which will correspond to particles with having that energy and that angular momentum, will be in a marginally stable circular orbit. And the slightest perturbation will make the particle fall into the black hole. Anything with higher energy, 4, will just fall straight into the black hole. So there is an essential difference. And I want to dwell on this essential difference. Because this leads to the concept of the last circular orbit around a black hole. And this will play a very important role when we discuss in a future lecture the recently obtained image of the shadow of the black hole in M87 and more recently the image of the shadow of the black hole at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. What is plotted on the y-axis is the effective potential and what is plotted on the x-axis is the distance from the central star, center of the star in units of the Schwarzschild radius Rg. So it is small r divided by Rg. So this ratio equal to 1 means you are at the Schwarzschild radius. You are at twice the Schwarzschild radius. You are at three times the Schwarzschild radius and so on. What is plotted is the effective potential for a particular value of the angular momentum. If the angular momentum is different, the effective potential will be different. So I'll plot it for a couple of more angular momenta in a moment, but just look at this. So I put a particle, a green particle, on the top of this effective potential. That will go around in a circle. The circle is this azimuthal motion. And it will go around, uh, uh, go around in a circle. But now let me now decrease the angular momentum so that the effective potential is over there. And the maximum of the effective potential has come down compared to before. Now let me put a particle over there. That will also be going around in a circular orbit. Now I decrease the angular momentum even further. And I put a particle 3 over there. That particle will also go in a circular orbit. But this time the orbit will be marginally stable or potentially unstable. So this is the last stable circular orbit. The radius of the last circular or stable circular orbit is 3 in units of r divided by rg, or the radius is 3 times the Schwarzschild radius. So as an astronomer or a stone approaches the black hole, the last chance it has to save itself is to go into a circular orbit at a radius of 3 Schwarzschild radius. So don't be smug and say, I'm okay as long as I'm not entering the event horizon. No, 
even if you are at a distance of 3 rg remember this orbit is marginally stable and you will be going awfully fast your speed will be half the speed of light so this is the concept of the last stable orbit for a massive particle okay so if you didn't understand the details please remember the last stable orbit around a non rotating spherically symmetric schwarzschild black hole has a radius of 3 times the schwarzschild radius now suppose you are dealing with a photon motion of light around a schwarzschild black hole the star is collapsing and it's emitting light and let us say the star has reached a certain critical radius what will happen to the light it emits will it continue to reach an astronomer at infinity and that is shown in this very important diagram what is shown on the y axis is the impact parameter in other words a photon coming in this direction impact parameter is that distance impact parameter is that distance so if the photon is coming like this the impact parameter is this if the photon is coming like this the impact parameter is smaller okay so what is plotted is the impact parameter of the incident photon as a function of the distance here is the central uh, black hole now let's imagine photon 3 photon 3 is coming at a large impact parameter it will swing around the black hole and escape to infinity is no problem whatsoever now let us look at photon 2 whose impact parameter which is shown by this blue line this distance is the impact parameter for photon 2 that impact parameter has a value 3 square root of 3 divided by 2 times the schwarzschild radius where did this magical number come from don't worry that comes if you look at this problem very carefully if you want to see read more about it i suggest you look at landover lifshitz classical theory of fields for example or any other book on general relativity i just want you to know that there is such a critical impact parameter whose value is 3 root 3 by 2 times the schwarzschild radius now that photon 2 will enter a circular orbit whose radius will be 1.5 times the schwarzschild radius right so 3 root 3 by 2 schwarzschild radius is not the radius of this uh, orbit it is the impact parameter that is th this line the distance of that line from the center of the black hole so that is the critical impact parameter the radius of the circular orbit that the photon will go into is 3 by 2 times the schwarzschild radius and that photon has a chance of now and then escaping to infinity but also now and then falling into the black hole so as the as a star collapses the last photons you will receive from the star is not when it crosses the event horizon but long before that at 1.5 times the schwarzschild radius it emits a photon those photons are trapped around the black hole as an eternal cloud of photons and those photons now and then can escape highly redshift corresponding to this radius all right so even for light there is a last stable circular orbit now the last un of course it's an unstable circular orbit because the photons can either escape or fall in and of course the velocity of the particle in orbit will be c so it's for light or maybe neutrinos and massless particles now let us remember that real stars rotate therefore real stars when they collapse and become black holes will form rotating black holes one can now ask the question is there an exact solution to einstein's gravitational field equation around a uniformly rotating massive body 
Just as Schwarzschild discovered in 1916, the exact solution around a spherically symmetric non-rotating body. Yes, there is, and that took a long time to find. In 1964, a New Zealand mathematician by the name Roy Kerr discovered an exact solution for the geometry of space-time around a rotating star. So that made it the second exact solution of Einstein's equation of general relativity since 1916. So it took a very long time. Now, the Kerr metric, as I shall say in the next lecture, describes not just a rotating star, but it describes every conceivable rotating black hole. Now let us introduce the notion of an angular momentum parameter A. A is the angular momentum J per unit mass of the black hole, or J over M. It turns out that this is a convenient parameter to introduce. where J is the angular momentum. Now the maximum value of A is M. So maximum value of A is M. In other words, J can at most be proportional to M squared. Such a black hole is known as an extremely rotating curved black hole. In other words, a black hole cannot rotate faster than that. You will see why it cannot rotate faster than that if you look at the equation that I'm going to flash. All I want you to appreciate now is the notion of an extremal black hole. Just as you would say in Newtonian theory, a star cannot rotate with an angular velocity greater than a certain value because then the centrifugal forces will disrupt the star. In a similar fashion, there is a maximum angular momentum for a rotating black hole also. Now here is the Kerr metric one of the most important discoveries in the 20th century. I don't expect you to look at it in detail or even understand it, but I only want you to appreciate one or two things, one or two differences between this and Schwarzschild's metric. Now, please notice that a rotating black hole will not be spherically symmetric. It will be oblate. And therefore, there is a difference between the equatorial plane and higher latitudes or lower latitudes. All right? So what I have shown here is the curve metric in the equatorial plane. Just to be specific, that's all. Now, let us look at the Schwarzschild metric. Because the Schwarzschild metric is for a spherically symmetric black hole or a spherically symmetric massive body. And therefore, it's valid at all uh, uh, orientations because it is um, axially symmetric about any axis. Now, you notice the differences are two. This term, which is the coefficient of dr squared, differs from Schwarzschild's coefficient. And there is a term which, is, which involves dt d phi. You notice there is no dt d5 in the Schwarzschild metric. dt d5 is very important. It is telling you that there is a new phenomena around a rotating black hole, a coupling between time and azimuthal motion, which is the phi coordinate. That will lead to dragging of inertial frames. I'll show you a picture of why I call it that. So, I don't want you to worry about the details. I just want you to know that there are two differences. One is this factor over here, the coefficient of dr squared, which represents the curvature of space. The curvature of space is affected by the presence of a massive body. That is Einstein's general theory of relativity. But angular momentum also give rise, gives rise to a certain force and therefore a certain energy, and all forms of energy contribute to mass, therefore that also contributes to the curvature of space. The second is the coupling between the time coordinate and the azimuthal phi coordinate. Now let's look at the Schwarzschild metric. At the horizon, 
the event horizon, which we call the surface of the black hole, the coefficient of the dr squared term goes to infinity because the denominator goes to zero. It is at the same distance, 2gm by c squared, that the coefficient of dt squared also goes to zero. So this coefficient goes to zero and this coefficient goes to infinity at the same distance. This is not so for the curve metric. So what I have plotted here is a projection on a plane perpendicular to the equatorial plane. The black hole is rotating about this axis. And there are two surfaces we must discuss. There is what I have called as a static limit, which occurs at a distance of the Schwarzschild radius. And there is what I call as the event horizon, which occurs at a radius of half times the Schwarzschild radius. Now, what is the difference? The difference is the following. So, let's look at this picture. This is the view seen from the side. The black hole is rotating in this direction. Now, what I'm going to show you is a view from the North Pole or the South Pole, doesn't matter. Let's call it the North Pole. So that's what I have plotted. So let's say this is the North Pole. So this is the event horizon whose radius is half times the Schwarzschild radius. And this is what I call as the static limit whose radius as seen from above is this, the central object is a sphere, the outside object is an oblate spheroid, and whose radius is Rg. This is what I called as the static limit at which the coefficient of dt squared goes to zero. This is what I call as the horizon where the coefficient of dr squared goes to zero. In the case of Schwarzschild metric, both these coefficients go to zero at Rg. Therefore, the horizon occurs here and the static limit also occurs at the same radius. But in the case of a rotating black hole, the static limit is a larger radius than the event horizon, which is a smaller radius. The region in between is known as the ergosphere. And if you are inside that ergosphere, that is where the dt, d phi term plays an important role. You will be dragged around the black hole, whether you like it or not. So we shall now specify these differences between the Schwarzschild black hole and the Kerr black hole explicitly. Now let's first consider a non-rotating, spherically symmetric Schwarzschild black hole. Inside this event horizon, whose radius is Rg, particles and light cannot be at rest with respect to infinity. That is, it will have to fall into smaller and smaller and smaller radii till it goes to the center of the black hole. Inside the event horizon, R equal to constant orbits are not allowed, either for material particles or for light. Particles and light have to move radially towards the central singularity. And as seen by a distant observer, it will take an infinite time for a particle to reach Rg, which is the event horizon. In other words, if I drop a stone, an outside observer will say the stone never reaches the black hole. It will slow down and slow down and slow down. As it reaches the event horizon, its velocity goes to zero, so it never really reaches the event horizon. This is the summary of the description of the Schwarzschild black hole. Now let us look at the same statement for a, a rotating black hole, a curved black hole. Inside the ergosphere, which is the region between the static limit and the event horizon, pi equal to constant is not possible. We said before, inside the event horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole, r equal to constant orbits are not possible. Here, 
phi equal to constant is not possible. So the moment a particle or a photon enters there, it will be dragged around the black hole, even if it was not initially having any angular momentum. It will be dragged around the black hole because space-time itself is being dragged around the black hole. The metric has a term which is dt d phi, that is the dragging of inertial frames. All inertial frames will be dragged by the rotating black hole. Particles and light must rotate around the axis of symmetry. You have no choice. But r equal to constant is allowed inside the ergosphere. Remember, you are not inside the event horizon. You are only inside the ergosphere. r is equal to zero is possible. In fact, you can have a particle entering the ergosphere and exiting the ergosphere. No problem whatsoever. r can either decrease or increase. Whereas for the short shell black hole, you could r can could never be constant or increase. It has to decrease. Therefore, consequences: a particle which by mistake, if it enters the ergosphere, can actually say "oops" and step out of the ergosphere and escape back to infinity. Particles can reach the ergosphere in a finite time. Remember, an astronomer at infinity threw a stone towards a short shell black hole, and it took an infinite time for the stone to reach the event horizon. Here, it will not take an infinite time. In a finite time, the stone will reach the ergosphere, but here also, it will take an infinite time to reach the horizon. But it will take a finite time to reach. The ergosphere. So I can merely have a vacation package, a chartered plane, go into the ergosphere and come out. But before we do that, let us appreciate this experiment we did before. The point of emission is at the center of an expanding spherical wavefront, which was pulled towards the black hole as the point of emission gets closer and closer to the black hole. Now, in addition to the wavefront being pulled towards the black hole, it is also shear because the black hole is rotating in that direction. And therefore, everything, even as it approaches the ergosphere, you don't have to wait till it approaches the ergosphere. You are being dragged because the dt d5 of the Kerr metric has nothing to do with black holes. It is the metric around a rotating massive body. So the dragging of inertial frame, coupling of dt and d phi, happens at all distances. It just becomes dramatic the moment you enter the ergosphere. So light emitted inside the ergosphere, the wavefront will not only detach from the point of emission, but the wavefront will also uh, be dragged along uh, with the black hole in the direction of the rotation. So now let us do the following experiment. I drop a stone or a photon from infinity around a rotating black hole. This is the distance. This is the uh, uh, sh short shell radius. This is r divided by m, not r divided by rg, okay, just r divided by m. Sometimes relativists use units in which uh, c is equal to 1 and so on, but let's not worry about it. I've explicitly written here. When I say 2, that corresponds to the short shell radius, not 1. 2 corresponds to 2gm by c squared. All right, fine. Just keep that in mind. So the stone or the photon will fall in radially, and then as it approaches the black hole, then you notice that it's beginning to move away from the radial direction. Instead of just falling in like this, it's moving away from the black hole. That's because space is being dragged. Inertial frames are being dragged. Then finally, it is made to go round and round and round at a radius equal to half the Schwarzschild radius, which is the event horizon. So this is the computer plot. So let me read it out. It's a computer plot of the trajectory in space of a stone dropped from rest at far, from far distance from a curved black hole, a rotating black hole. Initially, the stone has zero angular momentum. It is falling radially towards the 
rotating black hole. There's no angular momentum. But a far away observer will see the stone spiral in. It will acquire an angular momentum. And then at r equal to m, it will circulate forever. The last stable circular orbit around a rotating black hole. So this is an extraordinary thing. You think about it. It's an example of an angular motion without angular momentum. You drop the stone radially towards the rotating body. If I drop the stone radially towards the Earth from the Moon, it will fall radially to the Earth. But what you are saying is, in general relativity, it will not fall radially because the Earth is rotating. Therefore, space-time around the Earth is also being dragged by the rotation of the Earth and therefore the stone will spiral in. In the case of the Earth, this will be an insignificant effect. But when the object is a black hole, this dragging of inertial frame becomes extremely important. Now, finally, to end this lecture and to amuse you, I'm going to tell you about a very, very clever experiment that Roger Penrose proposed way back in 1967 or 68. Here is a rotating black hole. The red circle is the ergosphere. The black circle is the event horizon inside. The radius of the red circle is the Schwarzschild radius. The radius of the black circle is half the Schwarzschild radius. A particle comes in from infinity with positive energy. Particles can only have positive energy in the world we live in. But when it comes inside the ergosphere, it decides to split into a particle with negative energy and a particle with positive energy so that the total energy minus plus plus is the energy it originally had. Now, what do you mean particle with negative energy? Particles with negative energy, you just said, cannot exist. True, it cannot exist in the world we live in. But inside the ergosphere, negative energy states are allowed. So a particle can have negative energy with respect to infinity as long as it is inside the ergosphere. So what I'm saying is, let us consider a particle with positive energy entering the ergosphere and splitting into two particles. One particle, which is the dashed particle, has negative energy and the other has positive energy. Let us say that this incident particle has energy of plus 10 in some units. It breaks up into two particles, one with energy minus 5, other with energy plus 15. So plus 15 minus 5 is plus 10, which is the energy that I have. There is no fraud. The particle inside the ergosphere legitimately splits into a particle with a negative energy and positive energy, which is greater than the incident energy. The particle with negative energy falls into the event horizon. It's gone from this universe. But the particle with positive energy, the green particle, says, I've been a nice vacation. Let me get out of the ergosphere and go back and tell the story. So the positive energy, positive energy particle comes out, but with a larger energy. It went in with units of plus 10 energy. It came out with plus 15 in the same units of energy. So what Penrose has managed to do in this case is that to extract energy from the black hole. How, where did this energy come from? He has extracted energy from a rotating black hole. So someday, if there is energy crisis on Earth, all you have to do is to find a rotating black hole or form a rotating black hole in the laboratory and repeat this Penrose process. If you could do that, there's been no fraud. All you're doing is extracting energy from the rotational energy of the central black hole. So with that, we conclude part one of our discussion of black holes of general relativity. 
There's been a lot for you to think about and you have to listen to this lecture once again or twice perhaps rather carefully. In the next lecture, we will go on to something that you would have all heard about. I shall discuss the great discovery, revolutionary discoveries by Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking. Till then, thank you very much for your kind attention.